nothing like some practice on a Wednesday. Okay, so let's take a look at a practice problem. And this is naming an aromatic compound. And it just says, what's the proper name for this compound? You have a couple of possibilities here. And I think that, you know, the first thing you have to remember is that if you have a parent aromatic compound, you have to be able to identify that. And this compound is a phenol, right? So we have a phenol in this compound. Now I'm just going to put this in a green sort of circle here or whatever. So we know that this is some kind of phenol. We see phenol, phenol, phenol. And you notice that this one here says phenol. Okay, so you want to make sure that you know the difference between a phenol. So a phenol is when you have an aromatic ring that has a hydroxyl group on it. That's phenol. When you have a phenol, a phenol is a thing. It's definitely a thing. But that's just when you have an aromatic ring as a as a side group or as it is a chain, right? Like methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl, phenol would be in that group. So a phenol is nothing more than um, an alkyl group or it's, a, it's an aryl group, but it's like an alkyl group in that respect. So we can cross A off of the list right away. Are there any other answers here that somebody noticed right away? Oh, I can scratch that one off. There's one of them that I think is abundantly clear that's just, it's a no-no out of B, C, and D. So, so since the compound is tri-substituted, we have one, two, three groups on there exactly. We got to eliminate B. We have to eliminate B. You cannot use ortho, meta, and para when you have more than two substituents. And you can't have para and meta in the same name. That's impossible. So now we're going to eliminate those. The last rule that I would need you to know is that you're going to call the carbon that has the parent group attached to it, which is the hydroxyl, that's going to be carbon number one. So then we number it. We can go clockwise or counterclockwise, but we have to give the next group the lowest possible number, which would be the nitro if we go counterclockwise. So one, two, three. So we have a three nitro and a four bromo. Well, bromo, the letter B, comes before N. So we have the four bromo, three nitro phenol. So the answer would be um, would be C. And you can see what they did wrong in D is they called it some kind of one bromo nitro. So they didn't even count. You know, this is carbon number one, which is, you know, a big rule that is broken. All right. Other aromatic compounds that you need to know, and I can't, maybe I can't think of them all off the top of my head, but you need to be able to identify, what if you had a methoxy group on an aromatic ring? Does anybody know the name of that compound? You have a methoxy group. That's called... So that would be anisole, so anisole. Another one that's really uh, important that you know is when you have a methyl ketone attached directly to an aromatic ring, that's called um, acetophenone. So acetophenone, that's another one that's important. Um, other ones that I would say would be pretty crucial would be things like aniline. Students are usually pretty good with aniline because you see it so much in organic chemistry. So that's this compound here. Not the best drawing, not the worst, but aniline would be another one that's really important. Um, styrene, styrene doesn't come up a lot except for in chapter 27, but styrene is when you have a vinyl group coming off of your aromatic ring. So this is styrene. And of course you need to know things like toluene, right? And phenol, of course. So anyhow, we'll leave it at that, but those are the kind of rules that I wanted to cover there. The next one I wanted to look at was this one here. I thought it was a good one because we don't talk about a ton of amide nomenclature. But this question says, which is the structure? And I'm looking at this question here. Which is the structure of N-phenyl 4-nitrobenzamide? Now, you see that we have a benzamide. So benzamide, if you remember, we had uh, benzoic acid. Well, if you made the amide of benzoic acid like this, like this, this is called benzamide. Okay, this compound right here is just the amide equivalent of benzoic acid. So benzamide. So that means we're going to find this piece somewhere in the compound. Another thing I noticed is that it's got N-phenyl. 
So that tells you that you have a nitrogen and then it's got a phenyl attached to it. So that means you can eliminate this one because it doesn't have a phenyl attached to the nitrogen. You can eliminate this one because it doesn't have a phenyl attached to the nitrogen. This one is an N phenyl, isn't it? So that might be a possibility. We'll put a check mark there. And this one has a, you know, it has a four nitro phenyl attached to it, but we'll just put a check mark by that one too. So we've got N methyl four nitro benzamide. So if you know what benzamide is, what I have drawn in red, you know that the nitro, the four nitro would be here, right? Because we assume that this is carbon number one. One, two, three, four nitro. And then if you eliminate one of those hydrogens and replace it with a phenyl, then you have this compound right here, C, which is N phenyl four nitro benzamide. So make sure you review amide nomenclature and that you understand, you know, an N methyl, an N ethyl, N N diethyl, N phenyl, all that kind of stuff, which we not only see in amide nomenclature, but also in the nomenclature of, or we can see it in the nomenclature of secondary and tertiary amines. If you remember when we learned amine nomenclature, we did a whole section on primary amines, and then kind of after that, we tackled secondary and tertiary. And I said, oh, there's new rules for these. So that's something that you want to be aware of. Okay, let's tackle another one here. This one's just about functional groups. I'm going to ask you guys to answer this one for me. It simply says, you know, which one of these molecules contains an amide? So we're looking for four functional groups. We need an amide, we need a ketone, we need an ester, and we need an ether. All in the same molecule. There's, yeah, I'm going to look at it too. Uh, okay, could anybody identify a compound that has all of those? It's a lot of functional groups in the same compound, which is totally realistic. Could anybody suggest an answer for that one? If we look for ketones, so let's, or maybe we'll start with amides. Right, if you look for an amide, you can see that there's no amide in A. We have an amide in B. We have an amide in C. And there's no amide in D. Then if we look for ketones, we have a ketone in A, we have a ketone in B, we have a ketone in C, and there's no ketone in D. So we've eliminated two of them already. Next, we're gonna look for an ester. We have an ester in A, we have an ester in B, we have an ester in C, and we have an ester in D. So that doesn't help us a whole lot. Everything has an ester in it. And then the last one is an ether. And you can see that we have an ether here in A. We have an ether here in B, so this must be the answer. And then there's no ether in C, and then we have an ether here. So the only one that has all functional groups, exactly, right? It's not A and it's not D, okay? So yeah, we have uh, B. It's the only one that has all those functional groups in it. So make sure you're on top of the functional groups. You know, you don't want to get on the exam and start second guessing functional groups. What was an amide? You know, what was an acid anhydride? Those kinds of things. What was a carbamate? What was a carbonate? We look at a lot of new functional groups in organic chemistry too. So just make sure you're aware of your functional groups. I'm sure students are pretty solid on that, but I just wanted to take a look at a problem that involved functional groups. So functional groups, always important in organic chemistry. Let's see, the next one I had chosen was down here, this one. Okay, so this one uh, goes back to resonance. So we, we looked at a question that had to deal with or that dealt with resonance the other day, but I thought it would be good to take a look at another one. So we have this compound here, um, and there's nothing wrong with this Lewis structure. It's perfectly reasonable, and we can definitely draw resonance structures for this compound. You know, like you could just try drawing one. Like let's just say we took this bond and put this over here then we could draw a resonance structure that would look like this. We have CH3 bond to our nitrogen. We didn't touch anything here. We have our carbon. Now we would have a single bond to the oxygen and we'd have a negative charge and a positive charge here. There's nothing wrong with that resonance structure that I just drew. In fact, it's what I just drew. This is A, okay? So that's answer A. But my question to you is, is there any resonance structure on here that's 
you know, there are other ones here that are reasonable, but is there anything here that's better than, um, than the rest? It says, which resonance structure contributes the most? You know, which one would be the greatest contributor to the resonance hybrid? Is there anyone here that catches anybody's eye? I mean, A, there's nothing wrong with A, you know? I would agree with you, Karen. I think it's C. Why did you answer C? How did you know that? There's something that's special about C. Because the charge distribution between nitrogen and oxygen and the yeah. octet. Exactly. It's the octet rule, isn't it? It's the only resonance contributor Number one, like Karen says, uh, it follows the octet rule. And you, so she's right. The answer is C, okay? But you might be sitting there thinking, well, hold on. Doesn't this one obey the octet rule too? Yeah, it does. But the issue with that is that you've got the positive charge on the more electronegative element and the negative charge on the more electropositive element. So it's an okay resonance structure, but it's not going to be a nearly as large a contributor as C, where you have the negative charge on oxygen. And we know oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the periodic table, and nitrogen is comes after it. So we'll put here this one. Um, we'll put octet rule, octet rule. So all octets are satisfied. Obviously, in mine, the octet in the carbon is not satisfied. And um, we'll put here charges. I'm going to use the word appropriate. It's probably not the best word. Uh, we'll put here, we'll put charges on most appropriate atoms. We'll say that, appropriate atoms. And the reason I wanted to take a look at this is because, you know, Lewis structures are just one of those things that never go away. You learned it in organic, or sorry, in general chemistry one, then it never goes away in this class. I mean, think about it every day we use Lewis structures. But sometimes, you know, get into organic chemistry too, and the rules might kind of drift away a little bit. So yeah, you always want to find the resonance contributor where you minimize charges. If you have them, you want the appropriate on the best atoms to carry that charge. And then you want the contributor where everything has an octet. Perfect. All right, aromaticity, everybody's favorite subject. Uh, which of these structures can be classified as aromatic? Now, before we answer that question, my first question, is there anything in here, one, two, or three, that you would consider anti-aromatic? Because students love to ask me about anti-aromatic. Is there anything, is this anti-aromatic? You know, and I told you, there's not many compounds that are classified as anti-aromatic. You can Google it. There's only a few. But is there anything here that you remember as being anti-aromatic? I don't remember the name, but I think it's number one. I think you're right. Yeah, it's the cyclopent it's the cyclopentenol cation, isn't it? Yes, it's a real dark horse. You know, it doesn't show up a lot, and I I don't even I think I told you guys one day I don't even know if it's ever been isolated. Okay, but it's anti aromatic, right, um, uh, Caitlin? Because this carbon is sp2 hybridized. You can't argue that. So we do have a continuously overlapping system of p orbitals. I'm going to delete those because I'm not good at drawing them. But anyhow, you have a consistent, eh, a continuously system of overlapping p orbitals, but you have a 4n number of electrons where n is equal to 1. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4 pi electrons. And so that would be classified as anti-aromatic. Now, the other two compounds, this one is a compound that I even showed you before. This is called naphthalene. Naphthalene. This is um, what mothballs are, and this is definitely an aromatic compound. It satisfies the 4n plus 2 rule. It's 4n plus 2, where n is equal to 2. So it's a Huckel number. It's got a continuously overlapping system of p orbitals. There's nothing wrong with that. So that means we can cross this one off. We can cross this one. We know that 2 is definitely aromatic. So what about 3? Well, if you count up the total number of pi electrons here, if you were to put this, these electrons in a p orbital, let's say this carbon adopted sp2 hybridization and this one, which is totally reasonable because you could draw resonance structures like that, then you do have a continuously overlapping system of p orbitals around the entire ring. And let's count the electrons. You've got 4n plus 2, where you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The same thing as number 2. 
So you have 4n plus 2, where n is equal to 2. And so this compound is aromatic, and this compound is aromatic. Both of those are considered aromatic. There's nothing wrong with either of them. And so the answer is B. So make sure you know the Huckel rule, you know, 4n plus 2, and that you can identify an aromatic compound or ion. So this, and I mean, this question comes up in the book. It's, it was one of the questions that I asked you to do in the suggested practice problems. So, um, yeah, you just make sure you know the Huckel rule, and that's about it. Let's try another one. So this, this question is asking you, is there anything here that's not aromatic? It's not saying anti-aromatic. Is there anything here that's a red flag to you? You just go, that's not an aromatic compound. And this one's not simple, I wouldn't say. You know, nothing is simple in organic chemistry. So remember, we have to have a continuously overlapping system of p orbitals, and we have to have 4n plus 2 electrons. Yeah, it's A, isn't it, right? A is not aromatic. This would be, um, well, this is the answer. It's A. Let me get my red pen out here. Why is that? It's because boron is sp2 hybridized, but it's got a so that means it's got an empty p orbital. So that means you have a continuously overlapping system of p orbitals, but you've got four n um, plus two electrons. Where sorry, four n. I'm talking about something different here. Four n where n is equal to one. Now is this anti aromatic? Uh, I'm not sure, but it's definitely not aromatic. There's no doubt about that. That it's not aromatic. This compound is the um, tropylium ion. That's aromatic. This is the cyclopentenyl cation, that's aromatic. And this compound is aromatic as well, okay? So, which is pyrrole. So everything else here is perfectly aromatic. They all satisfy the 4n plus two. This one would be um, 4n plus two, where n is equal to one. The same thing here, it's 4n plus two, where n is equal to one. And this is 4n plus two, where n is equal to zero. They all have a continuously overlapping system of p orbitals, so everything else is aromatic. It's just A that doesn't satisfy the criteria of being aromatic. All right, so there we go. I promise the entire exam is not just about or aromatic compounds. There's a little bit, but maybe a question or two. Okay, question number one. I just wanted to ask you this one quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this question. It says, which structure corresponds to the predominant form of this molecule? So this is alanine. And again, you don't have to have that memorized for the exam. That would be something you'd need to memorize in biochem, but not in my class. So if we're at a pH of 7, we went over what the pKa of the carboxyl groups are and the pKa of the uh, protonated amines, so the ammonium. Could anybody guess, or not guess, but tell me what the answer is to question one here? This one's in the acids base section, right? But it's organic chemistry too, isn't it? Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. It's this Vitter ion, right? It's C. Now, how did she know that? Well, we know that the pKa of the protonated form here, so let's say you have, um, let me write it like this. Maybe I'll do this. So let's say we have CH3, CH. We have the protonated form here, and then we have the carboxyl like this. Well, we know that the pKa of this proton pKa is about two. Two-ish in that neighborhood is good enough. Could be a little bit greater, could be a little bit less. We know the pKa of one of these protons, the pKa was around nine to 10. Again, could be a little more, it's all good. But if we're at a pH of seven, that means we're in a more acidic environment, um, or sorry, we're in a more um, basic environment than the pKa of the carboxyl group. And so that's going to be deprotonated but we're in a more acidic environment than the protonated form of the amine. So that's going to stay protonated. And so we end up with the Zwitter, pardon my German accent, we end up with the Zwitter ion. So that's something that we covered in the amino acids chapter. So amino, amino acids chapter. All right, uh, question four. For my students who are interested in writing like an MCAT exam or something like this, I would put this right in there. I've looked at enough MCAT exams and Kaplan review materials to think this would be one of their favorite types of questions, you know? It's it's not 
complicated if you understand it, but nothing in organic chemistry is complicated if you understand it, is it? Okay, it just says here, give me, go from the strongest acid to the weakest acid. Okay, that's it. Now, if I, if I group these into two groups, so I have two compounds that have no charge, and I have two compounds that have positive charges. My first question to you is, what's going to be more acidic? The compounds in the red circles or the compounds in the blue circles? And it's not a trick question. Exactly. It's going to be the ones that are positive, right? Because an acid is a proton donor. Cool. So that means it's going to be either one or four. Now, there's a couple of ways you could solve this. Um, you could go with the pKa of the conjugate base and say whichever one is the weaker base is going to have the stronger acid. That would work. So that means, and what I'm saying is you could compare the pK of methanol, which is around, let's say, I don't know, 16, something like that. And then you could compare that to the pK of methylamine, okay, which has a pK of around 35. So if this is a weaker base, its conjugate is going to be a stronger acid. So that must be, you know, two must be the strongest acid. That's one way you could do it. Another way you could do it is... What if you just kind of remembered, well, hey, didn't we just look at the protonated form of aniline? And we said that the pK, when you have a protonated methyl, like was around, you know, 9-ish, 9-10. And you can kind of compare this to like an to hydronium, H3O+. Plus. It's just you're replacing a hydrogen with a methyl group. And that's got a pK of around, you know, um, negative 2-ish. Okay, close enough. Okay. So that's, you know, a way you could kind of solve that, okay? But either way, we know that it goes two first and four seconds. So you probably realized that the answer has to be A, okay? And that's totally fine. Uh, we solved it, you know, a couple of different ways. So there you go. So we know the answer is A. Let's just take a look at one and three. So, you know, why is three the um, weakest acid? Well, it's got the highest pKa, oops. It's got the highest pKa. So therefore, it's the most basic. So three is going to be down here, and one's going to be somewhere around that. Again, I can't predict what's on those kind of MCAT exams, but I've looked at enough review materials to know that they just love to ask little acid-base questions like this. It's one of their favorite things to do. So let's continue in that acid-base vein and take a look at this one here. Again, same kind of thing, but now you're just looking at the structures. Really, and you could memorize pKa's. There's nothing wrong with that. You could totally memorize pKa's if you wanted to. Um, like, let's say, you know, if you have a good memory, you might memorize, you know, the pKa of an alkane is about 50, okay? Um, the pKa of acetone, so this is acetone. Acetone has a pKa that's around 19. This is, um, this is ethyl acetate which is an ester. Esters have pKa's around 25. Oops, 25. And this is something that we looked at in organic chemistry too. When you have uh, a doubly stabilized enolate, so if you were to remove one of those protons, you know, we said that that has a pKa of around 9. Okay, so that's one way, is just knowing the pKa's. So you would put um, 2 is first, and then... Um, what well, comes next? And three is next, and then four, and then one. So the answer is C. Okay, that's one way you could do it. And there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. Some of my students have what I consider to be borderline photographic memories. They just remember every number. That's cool. That's no problem. But you could also use Aereo, you know, or a type of Aereo analysis to solve this. You know, you could say, okay, well, if I deprotonate one, I end up with something like this, which is a wicked strong base. So that's gonna be a super weak acid. It, that negative charge isn't stabilized whatsoever. So that's number one. Then you could say, well, if I have two, um, I would have, again, if you have a negative charge here, right? If you have the ester like this, this is diethylmalonate, right? So you end up with something that you could draw a resonance structure where you put the negative charge up on this oxygen, or you could have the negative charge up on this oxygen. So you know that's super stabilized. So that's definitely going to be a weaker base, therefore a stronger acid. Then if you look at acetone, if you look at its you know, conjugate base, which is gonna look like this, you could draw one resonance structure for it. So there you go. 
But then if you look at ethyl acetate, I mean, you can deprotonate that too. However, it's going to be a weaker acid. Why? Because when you deprotonate, you've got a one resonance structure here. However, you've got the oxygen over here, which can donate electron density like that. Okay. So because of that, that's going to um, uh, lower, lower the basicity really is all it does. Um, or uh, yeah. So there we go. So that's, you know, kind of two ways that you could solve that problem. Really, You could look at the co conjugate bases or you could just memorize the PKAs. Either one, you're going to end up with the right answer. All right, let's take a look at this one here. Here we go. Another question about aromaticity. OK, so this is imidazole. If you remember the amino acid histidine, it had an imidazole in it. So imidazole is a pretty common heterocycle. You'll probably see it in biochemistry. It says the imidazole ring system, which contains two nitrogen atoms, is found, with, is found in the amino acid histidine. Which statement is true regarding the basicity of the two uh, ring nitrogen atoms? So we have number one, we've got a lone pair here. And then on number two, we've got a lone pair here. Okay, A says both are strongly basic since the ring is aromatic. B, the nitrogen on one is more basic than two. C, the nitrogen on, or the lone pair on um, two is more basic than one. And then D, neither of them are considered basic. So my question to you, and this is something that we looked at, could anybody identify which one of these lone pairs is basic? There's only one of them that's basic. Could it be the, yeah, absolutely. It's one, it's the pair that I have circled in red, isn't it? Okay, these ones are basic basic and these ones are not not basic okay so the answer is um the nitrogen atom labeled one is more basic than two now why is that lone pair basic but the other one not the reason why is because the lone pair in the red circle is not participating in aromaticity it's got nothing to do with it the electrons that are involved in aromaticity are the four electrons in the two pi bonds, and then this lone pair. Why is that lone pair in the blue circle participating? Because those electrons are going to be in a p orbital so that they can participate in resonance, you know, throughout the ring like this. Okay, so we could draw resonance structures for it. But the nitrogen already has a double bond on it, right? It already has a p orbital. So if it already has a double bond on it, that means that the lone pair cannot be participating in resonance and therefore it is not involved in aromaticity. It's a rule that we looked at um, in the aromaticity chapter, obviously, but uh, it's something that I wanted to revisit before the final exam. It's something that you also want to keep in mind for biochem. You know, if you look at the protonated form of histidine, it's going to protonate at this nitrogen and it won't protonate at this nitrogen. All right, so the answer to that one would be B. Okay. Let's see here. So I had some other ones. So stereochemistry. I think I only had a couple here. This one I thought was a fun one because I find that by the time I get to organic chemistry too, my students are pretty good at manipulating shapes in their minds. And, you know, I don't know if anybody here is interested in dental school, but um, one of my colleague's sisters was studying for the dental um, uh, entrance exam, and she had questions that were, you know, some of the questions were like this one, where it had organic molecules, but other of them were just shapes. And they would say, you know, if you take this shape and you rotate it 180 degrees, then you turn it counterclockwise around this axis, blah, blah, blah. You know, so they were saying, could you manipulate the shape in your mind and then determine, you know, which one is identical? So the, or, or you know, which one is different? Is Which one's the mirror image and things like that? So it says, what is the correct stereochemical description between this pair of compounds? Now, this one, it takes some thinking. You have to really look at it for a second. But could anybody tell me without evaluating the stereochemistry at the stereocenters, like, what's the relationship between these two? So if we were to take this compound, so imagine I put a stick right here and we rotated this 180 degrees, 
Okay, so let's just imagine we did that. Then you'd end up with something that looks like this, okay? So you'd have the hydroxyl group going up here, and you'd have the methyl group coming down here, and then of course you have a proton here and a proton here. So now I want you to carefully look at the relationship between this compound and this compound. Maybe I'll put it in a green box, okay? If I put it in a green box, imagine that you're staring at this compound, your eyeball is looking at it in this direction. What you would see would be this. You'd see the triangle like this. Oops, that's not very pretty. You'd have the triangle, you'd have the hydroxyl going up and you'd have the methyl coming down like that, right, like that. So these two compounds are the exact same. They're identical compounds. And again, I think the best way to determine that is just by manipulating them you know, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, you know, I, I manipulated this one kind of in one fell swoop, but that comes from experience. But if you just rotate, you know, this one 180 degrees and then kind of look at this one from this angle, you can give me a thumbs up if you can see that they're identical now. Is everybody able to see that? It definitely takes some practice. But one thing that you want to be able to do is to be able to manipulate um, an organic molecule in your mind is the best, way. you know, I'd say that's probably the fastest way, but another way, and you have to be able to do some of that, but something else you want to be able to do is just be able to manipulate organic molecules on paper would be another thing that you want to be able to do. All right, let's take a look at the next one that I had selected, which is this one here. Um, did I do this one with you guys already? I couldn't remember. I always like, I like this question. I don't think I did, but. Okay, nobody's saying that I did. So this question 24, it says, if you hydrogenated any of these double bonds, got a double bond here, 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 and here. So they're all susceptible to hydrogenation, hydrogen with palladium, platinum, or nickel. So we're gonna treat it with hydrogen and platinum. And it says, which one's going to give you a racemic mixture, right? So what you could do is just kind of, you could hydrogenate all of them. That's one thing you could do. I'm going to use bond line structure. So remember that C6H5 is the same thing as a phenyl. So I'm just going to abbreviate this one here. If you hydrogenate this with hydrogen and platinum, what you end up with this is you have this, and then you have a methyl group here, and then you have a phenyl group here. So we end up with a stereocenter here and this compound. In B, same thing. Now we end up with this like that. So there's no stereocenters in that. So B can't be the answer. Then we go to C and we have a phenyl group. And then you have one, two, three, like that. There's no stereocenters in there. So that can't be the answer. And then for D, if we take D and hydrogenate that, you can see that you end up with just a five-membered ring and you have a phenyl and there's no stereocenters in there. So if you hydrogenate A, you end up, since the hydrogenation can occur from either face of the molecule with a 50-50 probability, in A, you're going to end up with a racemic, racemic mixture because it's the only one that you have a stereocenter in. So something that you want to be able to do is to be able to identify a stereocenter, you know, relative with with relative ease. And I don't mean you have to be, you know, Albert Einstein and identify it in a split second, but you've got to be able to look at a compound and say, there's no stereocenters, there are stereocenters, where are those stereocenters? Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Any questions about that? I think everybody knows what racemic means. By now I'm 99% sure of that. Okay. All right, cool. So there we go, a little hydrogenation question. Next one is another question about stereochemistry. It just says, which one of these molecules could, ha could have an enantiomer? So if we look at A, that cannot have an enantiomer because it's a meso compound. Um, if you look at C, there's a plane of symmetry here and there's another one here. So that's not going to have um, you know, that's a meso compound as well. So we could put meso compound on that too. So that can't have a set of enantiomers. All right. You know, in D, if we were to take this compound and if we were to 
change this to a dash and change this to a wedge, is that an enantiomer? The answer is no. Okay, if I make this compound in blue, this is identical. This is identical to this, right? Because if I make an axis right here in the middle and I rotate this 180 degrees, you end up with the exact same compound. And so D doesn't have an enantiomer either. It's only B that I can create an enantiomer, right? If I draw the mirror image of this, okay, like this, like that, that's an enantiomer for B, right? If I flip that around, so if I, you know, flip that like a pancake, then you end up with a dash here and a wedge going up like that. So that would be a pair of enantiomers. So make sure you're able to identify a pair of enantiomers as are found in B. So let's see here. All right. So we have a pair of enantiomers there. Uh, so enantiomers, non-superimposable mirror images. Let's try one more stereochemistry question. You got this interesting looking molecule here and it says you've got, um, you know, some stereo centers. How many chiral centers are present in this molecule? I'll give you a second to look at it. Did anybody come up with a number here? Is it one, two, three, or four stereo centers in this neat molecule? You could ask yourself, you know, how many carbons are attached to four unique groups? That's another way of thinking about it. Yeah, there's three stereocenters, isn't there? All right, we have a stereocenter here. We have one here. We have another one here. And then we have a third one here with this carbon. So the answer is we have a total of three stereocenters um, on this compound. All right, you see the carbon in red? is attached to a chlorine. Of course, there's a hydrogen that's unique. Then it's got this group and then it's got this. I mean, that's obviously four unique groups. Then you go to the hydrogen in, or sorry, the carbon I have highlighted in blue, that's attached to this group. There's a hydrogen. You've got a carbon with a chlorine and a methylene. Those are four different groups. And then the carbon in green is attached to a hydrogen, a hydroxyl, a methyl group, and then all of this. So it's attached to four unique groups as well. Nothing else in here is a stereocenter. We have three chiral centers in the molecule. What's the max? So my question to you is, I have a second question. The follow-up question is, how many total, bleh, how many total possible stereoisomers? What's the maximum number of stereoisomers you could have if you have three chiral centers in a molecule? Does anybody remember that formula? Yeah, it would be eight, wouldn't it? Right, because remember the maximum number of stereoisomers is equal to 2 to the power of n, where n is equal to the number of stereocenters. Stereo centers. And so 2 to the power of 3 is 2 cubed, which is 8. It would be a maximum of 8. And you definitely would get 8 stereoisomers out of this compound because you would have no meso compounds. From that one, there we go. So that's stereochemistry. Next one, I wanted to look at a couple of nucleophilic substitution. I wanted to start with question 14. This is not meant to be a trick question. It's just something that doesn't come up a lot in organic chemistry, uh, one or two. Um, when you have N3, that's an azide. So if you have N3, that's called an azide group. Azide. And we talked about azides a little bit. Um, so if you want to add azide, your nucleophile is going to have to be azide, right? So you would need to use sodium azide. So the Lewis structure of azide, if you think about um, N3 minus, it's got a total of 16 valence electrons, right? Five for each nitrogen plus one for the negative charge. So the azide ion looks like this. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 valence electrons. You've got two negative charges, one on each end, and you've got a positive charge like this. So an azide is a, is a good nucleophile, right? Another way to write the condensed version is just to say N3 minus like that. So you can see how that would make a good nucleophile to displace 
the iodide like that. So you'd use sodium azide, right? Not iodide azide. I mean, iodide has a negative charge. Just something I wanted to review with you is what is an azide. And we talked about azides a little bit in the class. Not, not a whole lot. So azide, the azide ion. The next one is a great question. This is, you know, this would be under the umbrella of chapter six, Gen Chem two, uh, you know, organic chemistry one and two. It's, it's all, it's everything. It says, consider this prototypical nucleophilic substitution shown in the box. The effect of doubling the volume of solvent would be to multiply the reaction by, a, oops, did I put the answer in the sugar? That's not what I meant to do. <laughs> would be to multiply the reaction by a factor of what? Now I'd put the answer in here, but can anybody tell me, is this reaction that you're seeing in this box here, would this be, and it's not a trick question, would this be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2? Could anybody tell me what kind of mechanism is going on here? Again, not a trick or anything like that. Got hydroxide plus methyl bromide gives you methanol. Yeah, it's an SN2 reaction, right? You've got a strong nucleophile, strong base. You've got a powerful electrophile, a methyl halide. So this is an SN2 reaction. Now we know that an SN2 reaction for this is going to be rate is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of the electrophile times the concentration of the nucleophile. So what happens if we double the volume of the solvent, that that causes the concentration to be half of what it originally was. So that means you're going to have K multiplied by half the concentration multiplied by half the concentration. If you take a half and then you multiply that, if you take 50 cents and you take the half of it, what do you get? You get a quarter. So you end up with K times 0 0.24. So that means you're going down to one fourth the reaction rate. It slows down by uh, to a fourth of what it was initially. So make sure you know a little bit about rate laws uh, and that you understand, you know, the rate law for an SN1 and an SN2 and an E1 and an E2. All right, rate laws. All right, uh, another question about SN2 reactions. Let's take a look. SN2 reactions are something that is introduced in organic chemistry one, but we saw them Avogadro's number of times in organic chemistry two, it says a bimolecular nucleophilic SN2 reaction is, so A says a two-step process, you bond broken, bond formed, version of configuration. B, two-step process, bond broken, bond formed, retention of configuration. C, it's one step, inversion of configuration, and D, one step with retention. Could anybody answer this one? First thing you'd want to know is it a one step or a two step, an SN2? Yeah, the answer is C, isn't it? Right? Remember that I always say it's, and I learned this from my students, SN2 or from one of my former classmates, SN together. Okay. So that means simultaneously. So that means it's a one step process. And we know that when you have an SN2 reaction, if you have a chiral center, at least, let's say you have a, a compound that's R and then it undergoes an SN2 reaction, it becomes S. So we have inversion of configuration. And so the answer must be C, all right? Nothing meant to be mind boggling there. Just kind of want to review what an SN2 reaction is. And with that in mind, let's take a look at this reaction right here. It says, what's the stereochemistry of the nitrile produced in the reaction shown? So this compound is the S isomer. We could double check that. This is our highest priority. This is two, this is three. So we're going from one to two to three. We're going counterclockwise, the hydrogen's in back. Yes, that's correct. So we have the S isomer, then we're treating it with sodium cyanide. But we know that cyanide, we draw the Lewis structure of cyanide, which looks like this. All right, cyanide is a good nucleophile. So it's gonna do nucleophilic attack and you're gonna have a loss of leaving group, right? It's a substitution reaction. And this is a secondary leaving group. So therefore it's not going to be um, an SN1 process. It's going to be an SN2 process. Uh, so if it's SN2, that means we're gonna go from R and we're going to make the 
or sorry, from S, and we're going to make the R isomer. So we're going to end up with the R isomer only because we know that SN2 occurs with inversion of configuration. Or put another way, we go from R to S or S to R. Beautiful. There we go. Let's try this one here. This is a real classic. This would fall under the um, umbrella of ethers. So this is a question about ethers. And this would actually, well, I won't tell you any more than that. It tells you that it's about ethers right here. Let's take a look at the question. It says, which reaction is best suited for the preparation of this ether? If we draw the bond line structure of the ether in the box, we have an oxygen, we have an ethyl group on one side, and then we have a tert butyl group on the other side. So we've got two possibilities. We could either make it by breaking this bond or make it by breaking this bond. If we were to break the bond in red, then you would need to have, oops, use my red pen. You'd need to have some kind of tert butyl alkyl halide plus ethoxide. If you were to break the bond in blue though, you would need some kind of butoxide plus some kind of you know, ethyl bromide or something like that. Which one would be the best way to do this reaction? Would it be the way that I have it written in red or in blue? Could anybody tell me? There's one of these ways that's a big no-no if I want to do a substitution. Yeah, the way that's in blue is going to work, isn't it? Because this is a primary alkyl halide and we can do an SN2 on that, right? We can do the SN2 to give us the desired product. However, if you were to do it in A, that's not going to do a substitution. This cannot come in and do a nucleophilic attack because this is a tertiary alkyl halide. So if we look at the possible answers, you can see that A is what I had written. Uh, this is not going to work, okay? This will not work, okay? Because you have two hindered of an electrophile this one is a Grignard reagent. That's just plain wrong. You would not use a Grignard reagent. In fact, a Grignard reagent plus an alcohol just yields deprotonation, so that won't work. However, C is what I had written in blue. Okay, that's this thing right here. And the same thing with D. With B and D, all they're saying is you're taking a Grignard. So, a sugar. So, where the hell was I? In C, so the answer was this. But anyhow, in D or B, um, the reason those won't work, if you take a green yard, so let's say you had something like this, like um, like that. Remember that you can draw the green yard where you have a positive charge here and a negative charge here. Well, if you combine that with an alcohol, and this is something that we looked at earlier on, all it does is rip the proton off, okay? So you end up just making an alkoxide. So it doesn't do any kind of substitution. A green yard is also a good base. So there we go. Okay, let's try another one here. Uh, question 25 says, which reaction would produce phenyl propyl ether? So what's phenyl propyl ether? If we have a phenyl group, that's a phenyl. And then if we have propyl group and an ether, so a propyl group is this, so one, two, three. And then we have an oxygen in between. So we've got this and we've got this. Okay, that's kind of an ugly drawing. So let me... Redo it. So we have phenylpropyl ether. Did I not have enough carbons on there? I don't know. So one, two, three. There we go. Phenylpropyl ether. Which one of these is going to give us phenylpropyl ether? Well, in A, we're taking phenoxide and we're treating it with an alcohol. That's just going to cause an equilibrium between the phenoxide and propoxide. So that will not work. So that's not going to work. In B, though, we're taking the phenoxide and we're treating it with propyl bromide which is this, so that's just going to do an SN2 and give us, you know, the desired product. It's going to give us the phenyl with an oxygen, and then we're going to have one, two, three carbons, so that will work. In C, this is a nice idea, but it's a bad idea. It's a very bad idea, one, two, three. You cannot do an SN2 at an aromatic center. That's impossible, okay, a big no-no. And this one here, I don't even know what the hell is going on in this one. You've got some base and uh, aryl bromide and an alkyl bromide, all kinds of junk there. So that won't work either. The only possibility is going to be B. So that's a way to synthesize an ether. And this would fall under the umbrella of the Williamson ether synthesis. Williamson, Williamson 
ether synthesis. All right, so some more ether chemistry. Take a look at another one here. Um, 28, this is a kind of a, it's not impossible. Let's just say it's kind of a complex problem. It's something that we looked at in the ethers and epoxides chapter. And this is the acid catalyzed opening of an epoxide. And this is a very special case that we looked at. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw this compound right here. So we've got a five membered ring and then you've got the epoxide pointing up like this, okay, like that. And then you've got your ethyl group that's going down. So CH2, CH3, like that. But notice this is an acid catalyzed ring opening. And what did we say about an acid catalyzed ring opening? We said the first thing we're going to do is protonate that to make an oxonium. And we said that if you have a tertiary carbon and this carbon is attached to one, two, three carbons, then it's going to the nucleophile, which in this case would be methanol. Your methanol is actually going to attack the more hindered carbon. Okay, so our methanol is going to come in and it's going to attack here. But where is it going to attack from? Now, this is where it gets interesting, okay? You've got this three-membered ring that's pointing up, right? It's all the way up here. And then you've got just a lowly little ethyl group pointing down. So this is actually the more hindered face of the molecule, the top, and this is the less hindered face. And so the nucleophile is going to come in and it's going to attack from the bottom face of the molecule and break this bond to make an alcohol. So what that means is that the only possibility is D or A because you end up with the alcohol on the opposite side of the ethyl group. Here you've got a methoxy opposite to it, and here you have a methoxy opposite to it. So, um, oops, did I put it in the wrong spot? Hold on. Um, yeah, here you have the methoxy in the wrong spot. This okay, the same way you do it in this one. Okay, so the methoxy is in the wrong spot in um in uh, A and C. So I have them mixed up here. There we go. A and C, the methoxy is in the wrong spot. Okay, because the methoxy is going to attack the side that has the ethyl group on it. And you see that in B, you have the methoxy at the same group, the same carbon as the ethyl. And here it's in the same carbon as the ethyl. So the question is, you know, did it attack from the top face of the molecule or the bottom face? Well, in B, that's the compound that results from the methoxy attacking the bottom face of the molecule, which is the less hindered face. So that means that B is the correct answer. And D is where it's attacking from the top face of the molecule. So it is not the correct answer. So what we're covering here, and this one is acid catalyzed ring opening when you have a tertiary carbon. If you have acid catalyzed ring opening and you don't have a tertiary carbon, let's say you have a primary and a secondary, it's always gonna go to the less hindered one. The only exception is this one here. And we went over the explanation as to why this happens in the lecture. And I don't know if you remember it or not. It's neither here nor there. But the reason why it attacks such a hindered carbon, you might be wondering, like, why would it do that? Why would it attack this? It's so hindered. It's because the positive charge passes through this carbon, if you will. And when it does, well, a positive charge is more stabilized than a tertiary carbon than a secondary and a primary. So that's why... That's the explanation for why this is a very special case. All right. So again, this would fall under the ethers and epoxides chapter. All right. And uh, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Even if you're with me, like, and you're like, I got to go back and look at it. But yeah, I think I get the gist of it. Okay. So as long as you understand the crux of it, you know, it's one of those rules that we looked at. I mean, there's a whole section of the book that we covered. But, um, you know, usually on the quiz, I'll ask one question about it. So I wanted to just kind of review it with you today. Okay, let's try a couple more and then we'll take a little break here. So our brains don't get too fried on OCHEM. Um, here we go. So it says, which two compounds? We've got a bunch of bromides here. Some of them are vinylic. Some of them are, al are allylic. Anyhow, which two compounds are going to ionize with the loss of bromide ion to form the same carbocation? 
Now, there's a couple of ways you could solve this. You could try to draw what you get when the bromine was to leave here, right? You'd end up with this compound where you have this allylic carbocation, and then you could draw a resonance structure like this. So you end up with something that looks like this, okay? Are there any of these compounds, one, two, three, or four? And obviously one is okay, because I just drew two resonance structures. Are there any of these compounds that you're just like, whoa, 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 a bromide is not just going to leave that? I'll give you a clue, there are. Is there anything here that's just a red flag, like no, 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 the bromide cannot just dissociate from that? Remember, it's telling you you would have the loss of bromide. So that means that bromide would just go away like this. This is the first step. Is there any of these that you're like, no, that cannot happen? What's the major, major no-no, right? So number three, that's a no-no. That can't happen. There's another one. Two, okay, those cannot happen. Because if you were to lose the bromide in two or three, you end up with a vinyl cation. That is a no, 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 no in organic chemistry. It's never going to happen. Okay, it's too unstable. So if the bromine in one leaves, you end up with this as part of the resonance hybrid. But if the bromine in four leaves, you end up with this. Where you have the pot, where you have the positive charge. Here, so you can see that what I have in the two red circles is identical. So they ended up forming the same carbocation, right? Because this one is primary allylic, allylic, but the uh, two in the circles, they're both tertiary allylic, right? This is tertiary allylic, and obviously this is the same, so it is also tertiary allylic. And so the answer is one and four. That better be one of the answers. Yeah, it's C. All right, we covered all of the first part of that study guide that I had posted. So let's take a short break.